Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and welcome back to another faction preview for Total War Warhammer 3 as we continue our pre-release coverage with Mel Ying of Grand Cathay. Earlier today, we unveiled the ninth playable lord in the Demon Prince. In that video, we looked at the opening campaign cinematic. So in order to save some time, we will not be including that in the remaining faction previews. So if you missed it, definitely go back and check it out. But in short, the kids love bear god Urson is wounded and imprisoned by Bellacor. And with all the path into the Realm of Chaos closed off by the Maelstrom, only the Visor with the Tome of Fates can provide passage into the Realm. Therefore, the Visor who also requires a drop of Urson's blood to free himself from the curse of the very Tome that he carries now needs to tempt all the playable lords into working with him. So before we jump into the Grand Cathay opening trailer to see why the Dragon Lords of Cathay will entertain the Visor, Let's first take a look at the Grand Cathay faction mechanics. First up, we have Harmony, which is an overarching faction mechanic that touches pretty much all aspects of the game, ranging from the units to the characters, buildings, and even the tech tree. And following this faction preview today, I will actually have a detailed guide covering Harmony coming out tomorrow. So if you're interested in playing Grand Cathay like myself, definitely check that out. Then in addition to Harmony, there is the Wuxing Compass, which contains a set of active and passive bonuses that you can set to aid your faction in specialized ways as you face off different types of threats throughout your campaign, and we'll take a more detailed look at the various settings you can use for the compass once we jump into game. And lastly, we have the Ivory Road, which is a caravan system unique to Grand Cathay factions that allows you to send automated armies to travel the dangerous road of the Mountains of Morn and the Southern Jungles in order to trade and acquire wealth to help sustain your faction as you deal with the constant chaos threats both within and beyond the Great Bastion. Now, let's take a look at Mao Ying's faction. So Mao Ying is the Storm Dragon of the Northern Provinces, and as the firstborn of the Dragon Emperor, Mao Ying is entrusted with the defense of the Great Bastion itself, and in terms of faction mechanics, she will have minus 2 corruption for all types of corruption in all her settlements, plus 10% leadership when fighting the Daemons of Chaos, leadership is morale for those of you coming from historical Total War games, and all missile units in her faction will enjoy 20% additional ammunition. In terms of Lord Effect, uh, Mao Ying's own army will get minus 50% upkeep cost for all missile infantry units, and she will add three points of int to your harmony meter. Uh, we'll take a look at how this interacts once we do look at harmony in game. And once again, we can take a look at all the units and spells using the browser here. Now, we will actually have a roster overview for the cafe faction tomorrow because the embargo today does not allow us to show custom battles, so I can't actually show you the units. But what I can do is I can click through every single one of these stat cards so you can check them out uh, ahead of time. These are the units that's going to be available in custom battle, of course. So let me just quickly get through this. And that's going to do it. So the spell is going to cover all the lores. So if you're looking for certain lores like Lore of Inn, which would be our main lore, you can go check them out here. We're not going to hover over all of them because there's way too many lore of magic to cover. Looking at the map here, we start out on the northeastern side of the campaign map at the western end of the Great Bastion itself. We're surrounded by a slew of enemies, both from threats outside of the Great Bastion, as well as some eternal issues, which we'll look at once we hop into game. And lastly, we have the same settings as we had before. I kind of explained the settings in the first faction preview we did on the Demon Prince, so if you missed it, definitely give that one a look. So with all that said, let's hop into the campaign itself. We'll first take a look at the trailer to explain why these Dragon Lords of Grand Cathay would even entertain the Visor.
Grand Cathay, a vast empire to the east, ruled by powerful creatures, dragons, who can inhabit human form. You are gravely mistaken. We have no interest in a mere god's power. No interest in power to use against the forces of chaos? I am Yao Yi, the Storm Dragon, older than the gods themselves. You are here for a greater purpose. This map shows the energy of all things. There should be harmony. But the world is unbalanced. My younger sister, Shenzhou, bringer of light and hope. She ventured beyond the Norskan Mountains, but was lost. Without her, without her light, darkness prevails. And our family has no comfort. Though I feel your loss, the Tome of Fates provides no insight to your sister's whereabouts. Ursa knows he witnessed her fate. Then why does he not tell you, Iron Dragon? There is mistrust between dragons and gods. If we save Ursa, he will tell us how to find Shen Tzu. Let me serve you, mighty dragons. I can reach Ursa lead you to him before it's too late for one drop of his blood your destiny is to guide us the armies of Cathay must breach the maelstrom and march into chaos balance will be restored to the world when Shenzhou is returned to you. Our goal is clear. To find the lost sister, we must hear the God Bear's testament before he passes into myth. I am the anointed guardian of the Great Bastion. Any breach brings great dishonor upon me. So prove your worth, mortal. Yes, great matriarch. There is indeed a rupture in the great bastion. The forces of Tsinch invade through the ruins of the Snake Gate and have taken the terracotta graveyard. Further along, the bastion remains under threat from the Changer's forces, or as you know him, the dread power, Qian Qi. Yet, despite the enemy assaults, there remain brave defenders ever loyal to you. Bolster them, and they will gladly confederate with a revered dragon. You will need such allies, for it is on the other side of the wall where the threat is strongest. The eternal siege continues, for the dark powers are never sated. And there, the orchestrator of this woe, Kairos Fateweaver. Face this demonic oracle, lest he bring down the Bastion. Fateweaver is insidious, and the invasion is only part of his plan. Rebellion festers in Nanyang's minds under the Changer's malign influence. Punishment must be swift to reinforce your authority. Before we can hope to take the fight into the Chaos Realms themselves, we must bring harmony back to Grand Cathay. There is much to do. Insignificant worm! Alrighty, so now we know why the two Dragon Lords of Cathay wants to work with the Visor, as Ursin is the last to know the whereabouts of their sister, Shenzhou. So, let's first take a look at how Mao Ying's faction starts out and plays. So there's a lot of shared mechanic, of course, between the two, so we'll focus mainly on what's different here. Uh, our first mission is to attack the rebel lords of Nanyang, and we will get uh, Astromancer, which is a hero uh, or agent uh, here in Warhammer, for those of you who come from other Total War games without any experience in previous Warhammer games. 
we'll also get a thousand added to our treasury. And the first battle is quite simple. No we will definitely play it out uh, just to showcase some of the units that we do have, as well as some of the battle mechanic in terms of harmony. But first things first, we have to talk about a lot of the faction mechanics, as we have quite a few of them. I would say Cathay is one of the more uh, management heavy factions in the game, because there's just a lot of things going on. First things first, we have Harmony, and this can be checked at the bar at the top. So as you can see, it takes into account of the total yin yang points from characters, events, buildings, and technology, and sum them up for a net value. In this case, we're currently at 3 point yin, and this is because Mao Ying is an yin lord, and she will add 3 points to your harmony bar uh, in favor of yin. And because we have three points in, we are in this zone here. It's shaped like a lotus. And within this first zone, here are the bonuses and penalties that we will suffer. Uh, as I mentioned before, we will have a detailed guide on this, so I'm not going to waste too much time talking about uh, how this functions and what the trade-off are, but just know that within each zone, uh, the rewards become less and the penalty becomes you worse as you sway away from harmony. If you are within uh, the harmony, uh, or if you're balanced at zero points, your effects will be the ones that are grayed out right now. And I think probably the most optimum play as Cathay uh, in, to start the game off is to actually recruit another Lord. So there are two types of Lord you can recruit. They are the Lord Magistrates and the Dragon Blooded, uh, which are basically kids or bastard kids of these dragon lords. They have lived for thousands and thousands of years, so they had many human lovers and uh, they had kids. And these kids will have various amount of dragon blood within them. They cannot transform, but they are gifted with magic. And you can get young or invariants of them. And each lord will give you three points of their respective harmony points. And that will help you balance things out. Now, it's the same for the Lord Magistrate. You can get different traits and each trait uh, is uh, there's a bonus as well as a harmony point so for example let's say if i want this martial artist i would have to pay you know 550 to recruit him upkeep increase as well as supply line so supply line is still a mechanic where the more army you have the more total upkeep will increase across the board uh, this is a price you have to sort of consider but i think it's worth the bonuses that you get for staying in harmony um, so that's all things you can consider. The Dragon Blooded are much more expensive, so I think Lord Magistrate is the play here. We'll pick up we'll pick up the one with the passive corruption reduction bonus. The Lord Magistrate takes charge. And once you have this new hero, you can obviously form a new army with him. Uh, it's a bit expensive at this point. But right away, you notice that we are now in harmony because of the three point young, three point in, nets to zero. And the bonuses become 20 points of additional diplomatic relations with all other Cathay factions. And there are a ton of them. It's not just you and your brother. There are also, you know, Cathay factions that govern the other parts of the wall, your capital, and so forth. So you can deal with them diplomatically. You can trade with them. You can form alliances with them. You can confederate them. So there's a lot of options there uh, in terms of diplomacy. It's similar to Three Kingdoms, but not as advanced, I want to say. There's not as many options, but um, it's close. It's a big improvement from Warhammer 2, to say the least. Uh, but aside from that, we're also getting 20% flat construction cost discount for all our buildings. That is massive if you can maintain this bonus. 40 points of growth, also very, very good. All young buildings and in buildings will get 25% additional income. I'll talk about that very soon. Plus 8 points of control, which is public order in Warhammer. Uh, it pretty much offsets the legendary difficulty penalty, so that's another very good bonus to have. Minus 5 points of corruption and army ability of ancestral warriors. And if we take a look, basically all our army will get one summoning unit uh, per battle to summon a unit called ancestral warriors. It's quite nice to have a unit that is just basically fodder. You don't have to worry about, you know, replenishing this unit. You can send them in to take damage. It's a nice little uh, bonus to get. Now, the thing about staying in harmony, the bonuses are great. But to stay in harmony is quite difficult. Because if we look at 
all aspects, let's say we look at buildings, for example, let's just open one up. In our main settlement, there are infrastructure buildings, there are defense building. And if you look at the icon, these are the buildings that give you harmony points. And it's all one point. It's pretty simplified. You don't have to worry about, you know, doing math. It's just one point in, one point young. And for the infrastructure buildings, which typically are your you know, econ economy buildings, they're not all economy. Like there's three types. There's civic buildings, there are industry buildings, and they are conscription buildings. They're always in pairs for cafe. And basically if you pick the young variant of the civic, you cannot build the in variant of civic in the same settlement, but they can be shared across the same province. So if I build like the young variant here in Nangal, I can still build the in variant of the same civic building in the mines of Nanyang if I want. So it's not that uh, constricting but within the same settlement, you can't have both. And they will basically function uh, in similar fashion. Civic is mainly about growth, uh, except for the young variant will reduce construction cost as you go up and the invariant will increase income. So perhaps you wanna build a young variant early on, get all your buildings done, and you can actually convert them over. You have to pay about 60% of the construction cost to convert them to the invariant, but you can see how the math would stack up. Like if I wanna build a building here, it would mess up my harmony in essence. So you got to consider that. And the industry is where you get your main income generated. And it's quite nice how they put all the multipliers where you can see the building. So I can see that currently I have the 25% multiplier for income. So I will enjoy that bonus to be 187 if I built this building, for example. Uh, the difference here is one will have a higher base value and the other will uh, have a lower base value. Actually, it becomes more apparent later on. Yeah, so early on, the spice market's like win-win. Higher base plus bonus from trade, and this wear market has less base income. But when you reach the final stage, 300 is a lot higher than 225. The difference of 75 makes a pretty big difference. Um, the 6% trade, at least from what I see in the early game, trade income doesn't have that high of a base value. So I think this is probably still preferred later on, but that could change depending on how the trade value increases as your faction grows larger, especially if you get more resources. Uh, in this case, we have pottery here in the province. Each province has some sort of specialty. If you have seen our uh, Demon Prince, you might know the Doom Keep produces marble, uh, even though the Demon Faction can't actually get the resource, we can because we are sort of a human faction. So that's really how the buildings work. They come in pairs. Uh, same thing for defenses. Uh, this only applies to defenses in the capital settlement of any province because you can only build ramparts and archer platforms there. Therefore, siege defense battles where you basically have a walled settlement to defend. And if you've seen any of the earlier promotion videos for Warhammer 3, you know that for siege defense, you can now build structures with supplies as you fight. And you can see the supply increases um, for some of these upgrades. More importantly, for arrow towers that you built, uh, there are different upgrades in them. Like you can change the projectile to cannonballs, for example, and those upgrades become unlocked through these buildings here. So you have different choices, basically, uh, with the different upgrades. And um, for each of them, it, it's slightly different. They would just change things um, on each other. And the main difference between Ian and Yang is for Yang, Defense buildings, most of the garrison unit that you will get will be melee because Young represents melee units for um, the Cathay factions and the Inn represents range units. So most of the garrison that you pick up will be range units. That's the main difference between these. And of course, you can only build one or the other. It will lock out the other uh, tree once you do construct one of them. And you can kind of get a view of all the units here. Now, units also have Inn and Young um, attributes, but they don't give points for the harmony meter. They're basically just a battle function where you get bonuses to say reload speed and leadership for range units and melee defense and leadership for uh, melee units. Did I say melee units earlier? For range units, you get reload speed and uh, leadership. And then finally, the alchemist and the astromancer. These are the two heroes or agents available to Grand Cafe faction. You can see you have different abilities depending on if you're targeting a settlement, an enemy hero, enemy army, your own army to embed it in. If you embed a hero, uh, it functions kind of like Total War Choice mythical creatures. If that's the only 
Total War game that you're familiar with, if you haven't played any Warhammer, that means that agent will be on the battlefield as a single entity unit that you can use. If you remove them onto the field, they function just like any regular agent with different abilities. They each have their own skill tree and you can level them up as well. Now, the important thing is Astromancers are in units and they will give you one point of in and Alchemists are young units and they'll give you one point of young. So these pairs are also imbalanced and you have to worry about when you pick them up as well. So there's a lot of moving parts that you have to consider. When are you going to get a young point? When are you going to get an in point? How should I keep things balanced as I move through the campaign? Because aside from characters, which we just looked at, there's also buildings, which we also looked at. There is technology. So this is our tech tree. And the best way I can describe the tech tree is three big circles. I mean, they don't really look like circles. They look like, you know, kind of um, rhombus, but let's just call them circles. It's, it's a very pixelated circle. There's three circles connected by the center line of uh, different tech. And if we take a look at the center line, you notice there's no icons on them. Basically, they are not related to your harmony meter. You can move from one circle to the next if you just research the middle one. But if you want different tech that's above or below the line, they are associated with yin and yang values. So every single tech above the line will be a yang tech. And when you pick them up, they'll give you one point of yang, except for there are four pairs. They're always the same above and beyond and below. There are four pairs that give three points. So there's a pair here and there's a pair here. And in the last circle, both the corner pair here and here are three points. Every other, oh, actually, there we go. Here, 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 here. There, there's four pair of them that are three points. Everything else is just one point. So you do have to kind of plan things out of where you want different, um, you know, tech to go. They don't take a lot of time to research and you can speed that up with some of the agent uh, abilities that we saw earlier. Astromancer has a target enemy settlement one that steals research rates that can speed up your research by about 20%. Uh, there's all sorts of things like that as well. So a lot of moving parts to time things because, you know, if I pick drill training, I know in four turns I'm going to pick up one point of young and we're going to have to figure out a way to balance that mainly with buildings. And then on top of that, you have events throughout your campaign that will pop up and that will give you uh, various amounts of inner young points that you have to worry about. So those are all things you need to consider. Uh, and the reason why you want to really consider them is because the bonuses are really, really good to be in harmony. So that's why you should definitely consider keeping it that way. And you don't need every single category to be zero. For example, if I have three points of in, in characters, but I have three points of yang in buildings, it nets out to zero. So right now it just happens I use the character to net out my other character. So that's keeping that uh, neutral there and everything showing zero. So that's the harmony mechanic. And we kind of talked about the tech tree already. We can also talk about diplomacy real quick because we are quite different from chaos factions. We actually have proper diplomacy actions. Uh, in particular, trade Celestial agreements, ancestors. which is really, really lovely. And you can see in the quick deals, we have non-aggression pack with Imperial Wardens, another Cathay faction. You can tell they're a Cathay faction by the shape of their banner. So if they have the flag like you do, then they are a Cathay faction. Harmony There's also Celestial all. Loyalists, another Cathay faction. And of course, your brother, the Western Provinces. And there's also faction that you're at war with. So in particular, the rebel lords of Nanyang and the descending, the center lords of Jinshen, the both of these are, you know, rebel Cathay factions that you have to fight. Um, you can start out the game with say, you know, trade deal. And you can see the trade value is not very high. Uh, of course, if we pick up pottery and other things, it should increase the trade value. And you can also add in a military access. You guys are friendly. And eventually, I'm sure you can confederate them, which will take away the trade agreement. So you have to consider that as well. And quickly just even out the numbers here. Now, I believe it's point two because like you can't add any more value. Like I can I can check that actually. See how good the. Oh, oh no, my distrust of the balance deal. It's starting because because it's not optimized. <laughs> Right, so uh, yeah, so much for balanced deal, saving us time. 
Now, of course, you don't have to harp around, you know, for a couple more, but uh, I typically play pretty min-maxy and OCD about things like this, so uh, this is going to be problematic for me. All right, anyways, I wish it just popped, you know, A16. That would be a lot more helpful, but here we go. Harmony is a Maybe I'll report that. They. This seems like an easy fix. Uh, anyhow. Child of the nine. I appreciate. And the reason why the deals work so well is because we kind of uh, flipped our rating, even though most of that rating is not applied yet. I wonder if the same three kingdom uh, techniques would apply, because right now we have a current value of 10 and ruler tolerance. That's our bonus that we got from our harmony. So like, for example, if I give him where is the payment? Yes, I will pay him. Ah, they they defaulted the gifts. That's that's nice actually. So I can't sort of cheese diplomacy in a similar way that we would cheese diplomacy in Three Kingdoms, where we would add basically one coin uh, into a deal. That way we can refresh the total diplomatic values. Uh, but we can still do something similar though. Uh, so for example, if I take the trade agreement by itself, I get a payment for it, and Agreed. I make a deal. May you live long. I guess it doesn't refresh until the next turn, so that's a more balanced approach to diplomacy. I like it, actually. And uh, once again, the value is incorrect, but since we're not playing a let's play, I'm not going to harp too much about it. We'll take long the deal. Live. Um, it's ready simplified payment in that you don't have to compare between per turn payment and lump sum because it's all lump sum, which is nice. Our brother doesn't really want to trade with us, with which me? is a bit sad. Um, we yeah, have the same... Ah, we don't have the same enemy. He's fighting against Clan Urshan, the Skavens. I wonder if we would sway him. So we could probably offer this to him uh, to pick up a deal. Having additional enemy, hmm, something we have to balance. You know, aside from that, we can pay him a bit of money. Not too bad. Yeah, not too bad. We'll pay him for the trade deal. He'll pay us back in about eight turns. Just Cafe off the trade deal alone. So those are the diplomacy options you end up picking up, you know, starting out uh, with uh, Warhammer 3. Uh, there's a lot of cool things. If you do get alliances with different factions, you can build outposts uh, within their faction and then you can recruit their units. So that's kind of a cool thing. Not Obviously not all their units, but a selected roster of units will be available through alliance outposts. So if I ally myself with the ogre kingdom for example and i build an outpost there i can recruit ogres if i ally myself with the skaven somehow and i build an outpost in their land i can recruit some skaven units so it gets pretty interesting in terms of what you can do and that's another cool thing added into warhammer 3. um i'm not going to build buildings we're just going to fight the, the first battle after defender. taking a look at our other two faction mechanics because remember we actually have a ton of mechanics so we have the losing compass and for those of you who've already seen the blog post about this, and also we did a video on this as well about what the inspiration behind the actual Wusing Compass is, um, which you can check out if you want. But uh, in essence, what we have here is four directions that we can point this compass towards, and we'll get different bonuses once we activate it. Now, I believe in the beginning of the game, you cannot change directions until turn three. That's true. Uh, but what you have is this energy reserve above each um, Direction, except for the Warp Storm Desert, which only has active effect but no passive effect. And the difference here is for Great Bastion, Celestial Lake, Dragon Emperor's Wrath, the passive bar will be built up each time the compass is pointing at that direction. So if I have it pointed at Great Bastion, this will slowly increase per turn. And I will build up different tiers, which will improve our active bonus, or passive bonus, I guess this is called, uh, for that region. So if I build it up all the way to the top, you can see the bonus becomes 2,500 defensive supplies and then 10% casualty replenishment per region in cafe. So those are great bonuses. And after I change directions, those bonuses will stay as the bar will slowly deplete. So these will slowly decline as we take turns. I think one point per turn, actually. So you actually get to enjoy the passive bonus for a little bit longer. Um, Aside from that passive, which is currently active across the board here, you can see. If you have the compass pointed at that direction, you also get the active bonus. And the Warp Storm Desert only have active bonus. 
Um, so if you want to see all the figures, just pause and take a look at each. And the bar is all the same. It's all between 0 and 20 points. And obviously increasing bonus. Uh, so if I want to build up growth early on, I might point at Celestial Lake, wait till it builds up to about 20, then flip to something else, say the Great Bastion, if I feel like it's coming under threats so I can get some replenishment bonuses, we can get some stats uh, to decrease the threat. And speaking of that threat, we can talk about another semi-mechanic, uh, which is the Great Bastion I Threat. The Emperor's wrath. And this deals with the three gates that's on the Great Bastion. If they're all under Cathay control, then you basically don't have any additional punishment in terms of the growing threat. But it's an eternal siege, so there's always going to be threats. If currently, let's say the Snake Gate is in ruins, we get 4% more per turn, or else it would just be 8%. And it'll tell you what's coming next, right? The Kurgan's Warband's coming next. So once it hits 100%, expect the siege, and you have to defend it. As Mel Ying, that is our main duty. Our main duty is to protect the Great Bastion, to make sure it's um, not uh, coming under threat, or it's not going to be broken like this. So fixing that is key. Recruiting a new general here on turn one, I think is also good because you can have him go out and claim this, because it's a colonization, essentially. And once you claim it, obviously, you can rebuild it, rely on the garrison for defenses. Uh, fighting defensive sieges with just garrisons and defensive buildings is going to be pretty crucial for the Great Bastion defense, in my opinion. So getting some practice early on is definitely helpful. Um, so that's the threat mechanic plus the Wuxing Compass. So the last thing we have to talk about is the Ivory Road. And the Ivory Road, oh, they have a tutorial, so we can use this. So this is a panel that will show you how trade works for Grand Cafe. Uh, not the trade deals from diplomacy, but the trade on the Ivory Road itself. You can send out caravan commanders, which can be listed here. You can have multiple caravans. There are ways to increase the number of caravans from tech trees and so forth. And you basically send them out with a set amount of cargo value. You pay for this, so you can have up to a thousand. You can think of this as a gambling fee of sorts because you're risking this much money to bring back more money from the trade, essentially. Actually, I can talk about this better than they can. So the starting point of the Ivory Road is always set here in the Warpstone Desert. There's a settlement there that you can take control of. Uh, it's in Shaoyang. Uh, it's a minor settlement. But once, uh, I mean, even if you don't have control of it, you can send out caravans. It's fine. As long as you're a Grand Cathay faction, you can send out caravans. You can up to a thousand cargo value in the beginning, and then you pick a destination. There are quite a few of them. So moving through the south, through the you know southern um, jungles, I think the warm path is the one you take here. You can end up at the Shattered Stone Bay, and the reward for this location, if you reach it, is 2,860. So it's a 2.86 multiplier on your cost. You can also go west. You can have multiple choices with different risk and rewards. Some of them are really, really far away. Some are closer and you can go to the Empire if you want outdoor. So you can see the trade off here. And let's say I pick this one because it's closer and uh, the reward is less, but you can see the journey time. It'll take this caravan six turns to get there. Currently, the caravan has 13 unit. The leading commander is level uh, is level one. He can level up. You can get more units. You can lose unit, obviously, if you fight. And you dispatch. Right, that's straightforward. And he's just off. You don't have to command him to move, but you can actually see him on the field, I believe. So if we go all the down, oh, that's the Great Mall. No, that is not the Great Mall. The Great Mall is. I have seen the Great Mall here. Oh, actually, it's. Only when you're playing as um, Zhao Min, you start out with the vision of it. Uh, but I think, huh, I guess he'll pop out during the end turn. But you're leaving from here, I think. Oh, the map is actually kind of hard to use. No, you're not leaving from here. Or maybe you are. This is uh, the Warp Storm Desert. That might be the right place. So your unit's going to pop out during the end turn. You get to see it after the first turn, just you don't see it now, which is awkward but he will start moving and every end turn he might bump into an event or he might bump into an ambush or he might bump into a friend and you can pay some money to recruit a new unit from various factions could be like a traveling empire mercenary that asked to join your caravan and uh, you can have him there or he can bump into an ambush 
uh, of ogres or whatever threat that you're moving through and you have to fight them. Now, the Ogre Kingdom factions will still have armies moving around, but they won't actually fight your caravan. The ambush, I believe, are all event related. It's not like, uh, you know, you're moving through and you bump into an enemy army and you have to fight through that. That's not how it works. It's just event based end of turn uh, missions. Some of them are fights. Some of them are um, just basically choices you have to make and you just have to get the guy safely through. And those caravan leaders will be able to be leveled up you can actually see them i mean right now they're not on the map which is why we can't see them but if you do have end turn you'll see them on the map you can level them up with different caravan related bonuses less chance of seeing an ambush increase the level of units and so forth and uh, it's a cool little mini game to help you get a bit more income uh, you want to have them succeed obviously because you're paying a thousand to get them going and if you get no returns it's just a waste of money so it's an additional mechanic for you to deal with. So as you can see, Cafe has quite a few mechanics. Um, that covers all of them though, and we can have our first fight and take a look at how the Favorite units perform, daughter. because we actually have some fun units. We have a Sky Junk, which is probably going to be one of my favorite units uh, for Grand Cafe. Uh, it's basically an awesome cannon in the sky. So let's fight this army here. Might of the storm. And we'll just jump into the fight here. Once again, we get a couple little tips. And I think it's just like, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's just one. Should be a pretty straightforward battle. Very easy fight. A general plus two spearmen plus one archer. It's the same as the demon prince one. So, very similar here. Uh, the maps are beautiful for Cathay. Just absolutely stunning and what we're gonna do as you can see in yang symbol all over the place melee units are yang and when you have them near an in unit you can see they complete the symbol that means you have a range unit in your vicinity we have two range units here i'm gonna put them around each other and the bonuses you get is Oh, currently, let, let's put Mao Ying away so I can demonstrate this point. The standard bonus... Oh my god, can I select... There we go. The standard bonus is 6 points of leadership, 12 points of reload skill. The up to part depends on if you have an amplifier from a lord or hero nearby. And for the oh, melee yes. unit, it's going to be 6 points of leadership and 6 points of melee defense, up to 12 points each. And the amplifier comes on heroes and lords. In this case, Mel Ying has a 100% amplifier. That's the biggest one you can have. So if she's close to the units, their bonus doubles. Right, so that's how it, that works. I'm going to put our Sky Junk right here. The range is massive. And I can even pull the units back a little just so that we can get the full glory of the sky junk as we go we can trade off for more magic we don't really need it although we do have one spell uh well actually we have that's the army ability we also have one couple of spells that we can use but we can just start so i believe mel ying has two spells actually uh earth blood there's a heal and there is a storm of shadows um which we can use to decrease speed we can transform into wait let's start we can transform into a dragon after 30 seconds the thing about transforming the dragon is you the lose most of your spell that you is the cannon this is my vow. that is just amazing yeah we'll let that go uh, as we take a look at melling here so she has ability to increase her uh, own attack uh, of nearby units as well but the thing here is when you transform just continue that line of thought is that you trade off you lose the amplifier you also lose access to almost all your spell i think there's only one spell that's allowed to be used when you are dragon form because the stats of the dragon form is just so good uh, the game has to find a way to balance that out by not letting you stay in dragon form like the whole time Stone and steel. there's a decent amount of ammo massive amount of damage obviously the accuracy is the thing but like with seven slashes it's still very, very decent. Like, there's also the snipers on the nest shooting those shots, and then we have the crossbow going. Right now, I'm just trying to get the reload bonus 
for the first waves here, and then we're just gonna transform. We'll lose that reload double bonus there. Just to showcase the dragon form. And you can see all the spells are gone. Fodder units from our harmony to take a look at the ancestral warriors that we can summon. Here they come. They're decent. I don't think they're like incredibly strong or anything, but like they're good enough. And you can use them as fodder units basically. Tank up enemy range, you don't have to worry about them, you know, replenishing, you get to use them all the time, every battle as long as you're in harmony. Okay, keep him busy. Everyone has routed, army loss kicked in. All because, you know, Sky Junk just raining death upon the enemy. Alright, very clean fight there. Couple more tips. See, the only two here. I wish it just keeps going, that'd be nice. Wonder if that's a, you know, development progress build thing. Alright, so your choices will be pardon the captives, take money, but you actually lose casualty replenishment rate for the next few turns, I think one turn. Um, you can gain some replenishment, you can also increase your leadership or morale for the next five turns by killing off the captives. I don't need any replenishment because we fought that cleanly, so there we'll just take no that. And we pick up Astromancer, which is problematic because the Astromancer... Oh, it's young. Never mind. So earlier when I said Astromancer was in, that's incorrect. So it's a young point and the Alchemist would be an in point. And we want to send our new hero to join our army to embed it. Uh, the embedded bonus of the Astromancer is, I think, scouting, which will increase our chance of finding magical items, or basically items, after battle. And I guess that's something we should also look at, even though we did not pick up any items in that fight, is that if we look at our character uh, for Warhammer, there's a lot of item slots. So basically, you have your basic items that you can equip and use, and also followers and auxiliary items that you can have. Uh, there are a ton of these items with all different sorts of effects that you can use to, you know, bolster your generals. You can put them on all the your lords as well as your great. heroes. So, ah, the Caravan Master is here. So we can see him here, which is awesome. So you can see that there are different campaign effects for this particular Caravan Master that we have. And there are skill trees that you can use to boost different type of caravan related bonuses as has ones to increase his like attack and his units attack uh, give him different mounts um, different magic bonuses as well so this is the skill tree for a caravan master and then if we look at melian herself uh, you also have you know more campaign based ones more unit based ones more spells for her to use more actual stat increases, different passive bonuses. There are no mounts for Cafe Lords because they change into a dragon, so that's kind of counterintuitive for them to be on a horse. Um, and the, you know, skill tree goes horizontal like most, so nothing to really talk about here, uh, but items, as we talked about, will be increased once we have our Astromancer Ready with us. Defend. Astromancers can also equip items, so they can fight on the battlefield. Think of them as a mini lord. They don't lead armies. They can just embed themselves in armies, but they also have campaign effect if you want to use them for that purpose. Um, they have skills related to each of their campaign effects. So scouting basically have increased chance of finding that magic item. You can uh, change the control or public order for local provinces. You can use this on target enemy provinces to steal research rate to increase the rate you can pick up technologies. You can target enemy heroes by wounding them, you can target enemy armies by modifying their campaign movement, and you can increase percent. So think of them as an agent slash unit mix, uh, pretty much what the mythical creatures from the Mythos DLC for Total War Troy is. Basically you have both agent actions on the field as well as the ability to use them in combat, which I know if you play Warhammer you know this all already, but if you don't, especially if you come from Three Kingdoms where there are no agents, this is going to be very new to you. Um, then of course our continuation will be taking on the mine 
We're not going to showcase that because I am limited by time uh, in terms of how much of game footage I can show during each embargo period. But essentially, I think I covered pretty much everything you need to know about Cathay Faction to get started. Like, for example, now that we got our Astromancer, I am pretty much guaranteed to pick up the Spice Market to balance that out next turn. So even though we won't get the bonuses for the end turn, uh, which is a bit of a shame because of the growth aspects, uh, we still will be able to grab it on the next turn so that we can still have the Ancestral Warriors and all those bonuses that we need. Uh, but picking up that first general there really helped with our diplomacy as well. So there's a lot of cool things that you can kind of plan out with the Grand Cathay faction. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this preview. We will be coming back with more faction previews. As I mentioned before, I know a lot of my fellow content creators will be doing Let's Plays. That's just something I don't typically like to do when the game hasn't been released because these builds are getting pretty much constant updates uh, in terms of the press build that we are using and there are still bugs in the game and I typically just want to wait till launch to play a full let's play. Uh, so I will stick to previews like this one and some guides before the launch of the game and there is a full schedule of my uh, preview setup uh, on the community post. Uh, that I have on the YouTube channel, or you can go check out the announcement channel on my Discord, which you can join using the link in the description below. So that's going to do it for our Mao Ying faction preview. And until next time, bye.